All right, so we are on week three of the Lenten series, The Lens of Christ. In week one, we figured out what Jesus was actually all about. What was he all about? What was he doing on his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem? And so we find out that he is all about bringing about the kingdom of God on earth, a place of belonging, of peace and forgiveness and unconditional non-judgmental love. In week two, we discovered the vineyard owner parable, and we went through it. What the kingdom of God looks like, which is getting what we need, not what we deserve. The kingdom of God isn't a meritocracy, actually, but the kingdom of God on earth even, especially, is about extravagant generosity. And this week, we turn to one of the most famous parables Jesus ever told, and one of the famous stories, one that you've probably heard of even if you aren't a Christian, or even if you didn't grow up in the church. Heck, we even have a law named after it. So much of the world, regardless of religion, knows this parable. So we turn to Luke 10, 25 through 37, to the parable of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus is on his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, and it gets interesting along the way. Jesus is about to paint this surprising picture of a Samaritan as essentially a saint, the merciful one, which is striking for many different reasons. One one of the first is that right before Jesus tells his parable, two of his disciples, nicknamed the the Sons of Thunder, John and James, are wanting to nuke a Samaritan village. They're like, let's throw fire down on that place, Jesus. And of course, as Jesus would do, gave them a lecture about not killing people, and they moved on, right? Not something we'd usually pass by, but it's a very short little uh, interaction between the disciples and Jesus. But that's what they wanted to do to these Samaritans. Uh, And really, we have to backtrack, and and I like these kind of like backtracks into why certain things happen. I love the backstory. So I want to go back to the backstory of why in the world did the Jews hate the Samaritans so much at this point in time? And and to do that, you have to actually go back a thousand plus years from this moment where Jesus is sharing the parable. So the Hebrew people entered this strip of land between Galilee and the Dead Sea. They entered this place about a thousand plus years ago. They called it Canaan, the promised land. And it's the same land that that Jesus is actually on. He's in the middle of that strip as he's telling this parable. So there's 12 tribes. And when King Solomon dies, the Israelite nation, the whole nation fractures into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. All 12 tribes. So Solomon's son, which we Uh, If you've read the Bible, no, if you've heard the stories from childhood in your Sunday morning Bible studies, you know that King David is Solomon's son, and King David becomes the ruler of the southern kingdom situated in Jerusalem. So that's how that goes, And, and they call it the kingdom of Judah, and Samaria is the capital of the north, and they call the northern kingdom the kingdom of Israel. They're probably a little further apart than Green Bay to Appleton at this point. And quickly, they become rival kingdoms when they were just one people and they fracture and absence does not make the heart grow fonder. Every town has that line. You know what I'm talking about. You know, I grew up in a a small town and then got married and we lived in a small town and we bought a house on the south side of the tracks, which meant something. You know what I'm talking about. And ironically, the college that I went to was on the north side of the tracks in the nicer area. And you know what that's like. And if you talk to a realtor in the town, they can tell you which side to live on. They can tell you where the expensive or better property is. And it's all about location, location, location. So don't be south of the tracks. And there's a fracture there. And you get that because I haven't lived here very long, only five years. And I know that there's an east to pier and a west to pier rivals. And I know that there's east side and west side in Green Bay, rivals split by the Fox River. So we know what this is like. This is not unfamiliar to us at all. So this biblical rivalry rivalry is, is not unfamiliar. And the two kingdoms, they clashed. 
They clashed over and over different cultures. They shifted. And the crazy thing is, and, and keep in mind, it wasn't like they changed their religious beliefs. They actually still kept them. They actually had the same religious beliefs. They both claimed Abraham as the father of the faith. They both claimed Moses as the liberator of the faith. They both worshiped the same God, yet they grew distant as their actual physical location from each other was distant. And long story short, these two different southern northern kingdoms were taken over over about a hundred years by two different foreign empires the Assyrian empire and the babylonian empire and and fractured it even more and everybody split and spread all over the place ah, and when some are liberated and they come back eventually the north the northern kingdom only accepts the first five books of the old testament that's that's the thing and, and of course it's not the way it was before it's not as clean and cut but the people from the northern kingdom come back and they only accept the first five books the pentateuch but the southern kingdom comes back with more books because they've got prophets they've got major and minor prophets that are telling the story and, and they get back, and the southern kingdom's very, very certain that these books, these books that were not there in the Old Testament, in the Torah, before they were taken into exile, they're certain these books need to be a part of our story. Well, the, the northern kingdom said, I don't want that. You know why? Because many of the prophets, as you read in the Old Testament, after the first five books of the Bible, many of those prophets shed the Samaritan people or the northern kingdom in a very bad light. So would they want to accept those books as part of the Torah for them, as part of their story? I don't think so. So the south and the north come back from exile in and, and pieces and fragments and a remnant. This is where they were. The rivalry cemented in their minds, and they became despised enemies of each other. They came from the same place. They came from the same beliefs. But they are now enemies because they grew distant, not just physically, but in their hearts. And so Jesus tells the story. Enter Jesus, and we go to Luke 10, 25 through 37. Now we know what a Samaritan is to the Jewish people. The parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up, a lawyer, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, in my Lenten devotional, Brian Zahn says, Jesus could, Jesus could have constructed his parable so that a noble Jew showed mercy to a Samaritan victim. He could have constructed it this way, and it would have been a step in the right direction, but it would still put the Samaritan in an inferior role and the noble Jew in the superior role. See, making a Samaritan a hero of the story, Jesus is essentially asking, what are you going to do if the people whose theology you scorn are more merciful than you? Mm. What are you going to do if the people whose theology you scorn are more merciful than you? And back to the Good Samaritan. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to, go, happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side too. Okay, this is bad. These are religious leaders who are probably listening to this story, and he's telling a story of religious leaders who are completely apathetic. 
So we talked about worldly powers and principles that Jesus was up against. And Jesus now is talking about religious power. And this one doesn't look good for those everyone would expect to do the right thing, right? And he goes back. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, I said that too fast, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. So you're following him here. You got the backstory. You know what the Jewish people thought of Samaritans. So you're like, okay, Jesus, can you imagine how this, this lawyer is listening to every word and his jaw probably drops when he hears the word Samaritan? His heart is racing. That guy, he's probably thinking that defiled, broken, evil human being, and, and barely even human for that matter. You're going to use that guy as the hero? What are you doing? Why are you going there with me? So Jesus comes back and he says, The Samaritan went to him and he bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine and he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And you're like, okay, that's, that's good. He did the right thing. That's what everybody would wish they would do. And, and Jesus could have ended it right there, but he doesn't. He's like, he goes way over, well beyond what was the call of duty in this situation. So Jesus says, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you any expense, any extra expense you have. So he goes, Jesus' story about the Samaritans, this Samaritan is truly a saint. This Samaritan is not just I'll get you to a place and they'll take care of you. No, I'll get you to the place, they'll take care of you, and I'll reimburse all the expenses that it takes. I am the Good Samaritan. And what a story. He says, Jesus says this, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The lawyer replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Pretty simple, huh? Wow. I mean, this is big. The, the expert in the law originally asked, who is my neighbor? But Jesus says, that's the wrong question altogether. And he ends with a better question. Which do you think was a neighbor to the victim? Jesus is saying to the man, you're asking the wrong question. It's not who is my neighbor, but what is a neighbor? What is a neighbor? A man named Alexander, who came to Christ while suffering in a Soviet slave camp, said that line between good and evil does not run between nationalities or ethnicities or religions or political parties, but right through the heart of every person. So, what is a neighbor? How can we define a neighbor? This is very explicit in the Good Samaritan story. What is a neighbor? Someone who embodies the kingdom of God on earth. Forgiveness, justice, unconditional and non-judgmental love. The Christian litmus test for loving God is love of neighbor. Let me say that again. The Christian litmus test for loving God is love of neighbor. And the Christian litmus test for love of neighbor is love of enemy. Mm. It's hard for me to write that. It's hard for me to say it. It's hard for me to think it. Man, it's easy to be a neighbor when you really, when you really like the person or when you have tons of interest with the person. It's easy to embody the love of Christ to people that are like us. But what about people who are not? What about people who have different theology than us? What about people who have different political ideas than us? Mm. Are we vilifying an actual political party? No matter what side you're on, are you? It's a litmus test. Think about it. Think about how you, you talk. Think about your rhetoric when you think and, and talk to others about political parties, about other religions, about other Christian faith traditions. And I'm saying that because I have to think about that. And it's a hard thing to do if 
the litmus test for loving your neighbor is loving your enemy. (laughs) It's a challenge every day. But that is the embodiment of the kingdom of God on earth according to the lens that we are looking through, the lens of Christ. And I'll end with this. A rabbi once asked his students how they could tell when the night ended and the day began. One student suggested, could it be when you can see an animal in the distance and can tell whether it's a sheep or a dog? No, answered the rabbi. Another asked, is it when you can look at the tree in the distance and tell whether it's a fig tree or a palm? No, answered the rabbi. Then when is it? The pupils demanded. Rabbi said, it is when you can look into the face of any person and recognize them as your brother and sister. Until then, it will always be night. Amen.